Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're diving deep into a group of bacteria that, well, let's just say they have a certain reputation. Oh, yeah. The Proteus, Providencia, and Morganella species. You know, they might not be the most glamorous. Definitely not the stars of the show, usually. But, but they can cause some headaches. Exactly. Especially in the medical microbiology lab. For sure. So we're going to walk through everything yeah. from their key features to how we handle the infections they cause. You know, a classic clinical microbiology approach. Absolutely. Understanding their quarks. Yeah. It's essential for us in the lab. And for this deep dive, we're going to be focusing on okay. principles and practice of clinical bacteriology. Ah, uh, the Bible. Right. I think everyone in our field knows that one. For sure. So are you ready to unlock some expert level knowledge on these bacteria? I'm ready. Let's start with the basics. Understanding these organisms. Okay. Sounds good. Now they're all part of that protea tribe, but each genus has some unique characteristics. All right. So first up, proteus. I always think of them as, you know, the swarming bacteria. Oh, of course. Remember those distinctive bullseye patterns they make on agar plates? Absolutely. That swarming motility is one of their trademarks for sure. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable. It is, and it's a fascinating process. It involves regular cells changing into these, well, these elongated swarm cells with tons of flagella. So they're not just randomly moving around. Right. There's a reason for the swarming. Is it to help them um, colonize surfaces or something? Exactly. You got it. Research suggests this coordinated movement helps them spread really quickly across surfaces. Okay. Like the urinary tract which is where they often cause problems. Makes sense. And speaking of causing trouble, their ability to produce urease, that's a key factor in their pathogenicity, right? Oh, absolutely. Urease, that enzyme that breaks down urea and increases the pH. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing that's not good news for our urinary tracts. Not really, no. Yeah. That pH shift can lead to the formation of, well, struvite and apatite crystals, and those can clump together and form urinary stones. Ouch, makes sense. Now, what about Providencia? Do they also love urease and swarming? Well, here's where things get a bit more complex. Okay. Some Providencia species, like P. stewartii, are actually really good at sticking to catheters oh. and causing these, you know, stubborn infections. So they're like the clingy bacteria. Exactly. Causing persistent infections, particularly in patients who have catheters. Yeah. And unlike Proteus, their urease activity can be a bit inconsistent. I see. Which can sometimes make identification a little trickier. Speaking of tricky, I've heard about something called purple urine bag syndrome. Oh, yes. What's that all about? That's a phenomenon associated with certain strains of Providencia stortii. Yeah. They produce an enzyme that breaks down indoxyl sulfate in the urine. Uh -huh. And this leads to the formation of, well, let's just say colorful byproducts. Colorful. You mean it turns the urine bag purple? Wow. Okay. That's both fascinating and a little disturbing. Can you imagine being a patient and seeing that? It can be quite startling, but from our perspective, it's a helpful clinical clue. Ah, I see. So it's not just a random color change. Right. It indicates a specific bacterial activity. Exactly. Now let's move on to Morganella. Yeah. They're generally less common culprits compared to Proteus and Providencia. Got it. But they can still cause infections, right? Where do they usually hang out? They're often found in the gut. And they can cause urinary tract infections. Okay. Especially in patients with underlying health issues or those who've been hospitalized for a while. So they're kind of opportunistic, just waiting for the right moment. Exactly. Now let's talk about how these infections actually show up clinically. Sure. Sure. What are the usual symptoms? Well, you know, these bacteria love causing urinary tract infections. Right. So the symptoms often focus on that. Frequent urination, a burning feeling when you pee. Makes sense. And sometimes even lower back pain if it spreads to the kidneys. And I'm guessing those with catheters are at higher risk. Absolutely. Catheters are basically a direct pathway for these bacteria to reach the bladder. They bypass the body's natural defenses. Okay. Let's get a little more specific about the clinical side. I know Proteus mirabilis is often linked to a particular urinary tract complication. Can you expand on that? You're probably thinking about pyelonephritis, an infection of the kidneys. Yes. Proteus mirabilis is particularly good at going up the urinary tract. Ooh. Thanks to those MRP fimbriae, right. 
Those little appendages help them attach to the lining of the urinary tract and move up to the kidneys. So they're like little bacterial climbers. Exactly. And I'm guessing this is where the urinary stones we talked about earlier can also play a role. Exactly. Those stones can block the flow of urine. I see. And then you have this perfect breeding ground for bacteria. So it just gets worse. Mm -mm. This is all painting a very clear picture of how these seemingly simple bacteria can cause serious problems. Mm. But we have tools to fight back. Yeah, right. absolutely. And that's where laboratory diagnosis comes in. All right. Let's dive into that. What are the key things we need to think about when we're trying to identify these bacteria in the lab? Well, the first step is often a good old-fashioned culture. Yeah. These bacteria tend to grow well on standard media like blood agar and McConkie agar. Okay. That helps us isolate them from patient samples. And once we have those colonies, how do we differentiate between them? Right. Proteus, Providencia, and Morganella. Do they have any telltale signs? They do. We can use a combination of biochemical tests. Okay. For example, Proteus is known for its rapid urease activity. We can easily detect that with a simple test. What about Providencia? Didn't we say their urease activity can be a bit more uh, variable? That's right. So for Providencia, we often rely on other tests, oh. like their ability to demonate phenylalanine uh -huh. or their indole production Got it. to confirm their identity. And I'm guessing those commercial identification systems we have are helpful too. Absolutely. Those systems can analyze a whole bunch of biochemical reactions really quickly. Right. Makes identification much more efficient. But as always, there's no substitute for a trained microbiologist eye. You got it. We need to consider the patient's clinical presentation, the source of the sample, yeah. and even those subtle clues like colony morphology to make a confident identification. So it's a mix of technology and expertise. That's what I love about our field. It really is. Now, before we move on to their epidemiology, let's take a quick break and come back refreshed to tackle those details. Sounds good to me. Okay, so let's get back to our exploration of the proteae. Picking up with their epidemiology. These organisms, they're, well, they're surprisingly common. Common? You mean like they're found everywhere? Pretty much, yeah. Ubiquitous. You find them in soil, water, oh. even as part of the normal gut flora in both humans and animals. So we're all walking around with these potential troublemakers in our guts. Well, yeah, in a way. But usually they're not a problem. In healthy individuals, they tend to keep a low profile. Okay. It's when they get into the wrong places, you know, like the urinary tract. I see. Especially in people with weakened immune systems or other health conditions, that's when they can become a real issue. So how do they spread from person to person, I mean? The most common road is fecal oral transmission. Ah, right. Because they're in the gut. Exactly. So poor hygiene, like not washing your hands well enough after using the bathroom, wow. that can easily spread these organisms. So basic hygiene is key. Got it. But I'm guessing there are other ways they can spread, especially in hospitals and places like that. Absolutely. Contaminated medical equipment, especially catheters. Right. Makes sense. That can be a major source of transmission. So proper catheter care and sterile techniques, they're really important in preventing those healthcare associated infections. Okay. So we've covered how to identify them, how they spread, and the problems they can cause clinically. Now, how do we fight back? What's the usual treatment for these infections? Well, antibiotics are our main weapons, but these bacteria can be a little tricky when it comes to their susceptibility. Tricky, meaning they're resistant to some antibiotics. Exactly. Proteus mirabilis, for instance, is often susceptible to ampicillin and other penicillins, which is good news. That is good news. But what about the other species? Are they as easy to treat with antibiotics? Not always. Providencia and Morganella, they tend to be more resistant to multiple antibiotics. Makes treatment decisions more challenging. So what do we do when we come across those multi-drug resistant strains? Well, that's when antibiotic susceptibility testing becomes really crucial. I see. We have to tailor the treatment based on the specific resistance profile of that particular strain. So it's all about choosing the right antibiotic for the right bug. But what happens if the usual antibiotics aren't working? Are there other treatment strategies we can consider? There are a few new options that are being researched. For example, bacteriophages. Bacteriophages, what are those? They're viruses that can target and destroy specific bacteria. Oh, wow. How do they work? Essentially, they infect the bacteria and then replicate inside them. Eventually, they cause the bacteria to burst open and die. So it's a very targeted approach. Exactly. And it holds a lot of promise for dealing with these antibiotic-resistant infections. 
That's amazing. Are there any other non-antibiotic strategies being explored? There's also research on developing vaccines. Vaccines? Yeah, especially for Proteus mirabilis. That would be a game changer, especially for people who get recurrent UTIs. Yeah. What's the progress on those vaccines? It's still early days, but there have been some promising results in animal studies. They're using purified Fimbriae as the target for the vaccine. So we're trying to train the immune system to recognize and fight off these bacteria before they can even cause an infection. Exactly. But it's going to take more time before we see a Proteus vaccine available for use. Well, let's hope that research continues to move forward. Now, before we get into prevention and control of these infections, I want to touch on one aspect of management that I think is really important. Okay, what is it? It's about communication, especially between the lab and the doctors. Mm. It's not just about identifying the bacteria. We need to communicate that information effectively so they can make the best treatment decisions. You're absolutely right. We have to be clear about what species it is, the antibiotic susceptibility profile, and any other relevant details. And it goes both ways. Yes. Doctors need to give us clear clinical information like the patient's history, symptoms, anything that helps us interpret our lab findings correctly. It's all about working together, collaborating, and communicating clearly to make sure the patient gets the best possible care. I completely agree. Okay, let's move on to prevention and control strategies. What are the most important things we can do to minimize the spread of these organisms? Well, as we mentioned before, basic hygiene is crucial. Right. Hand washing. Exactly. Thorough hand washing, especially in healthcare settings, can make a big difference in reducing transmission. And proper catheter care, too, right? Considering how often catheters are involved in these infections. Absolutely. Using sterile techniques when you're inserting and maintaining catheters huh? and limiting their use whenever possible, those are key to preventing catheter-associated UTIs. So it's all about breaking that chain of transmission, right. whether it's through hand hygiene or careful catheter care. Are there any other preventative measures, especially for people who are at higher risk of getting these infections? Well, for people who get UTIs frequently, there are some things they can do. Staying well hydrated, urinating often, and wiping from front to back after using the bathroom. I see. Those can help reduce the risk of bacteria getting into the urinary tract. So a combination of personal hygiene and lifestyle changes. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about probiotics. Oh yeah. Have they been shown to help prevent these infections? There's a lot of talk about probiotics these days. There is. Mm -hmm. And the research on using probiotics to prevent UTIs is still ongoing. Okay. But some studies suggest that certain types of lactobacilli, which are good bacteria found in the gut, right. they might actually help prevent pathogens like E. coli from colonizing the urinary tract. So it's like introducing good bacteria to fight the bad bacteria. Exactly. But we need more research to figure out which specific strains and dosages are most effective. So probiotics are still a bit of a question mark, but an interesting area to keep an eye on. Now, before we wrap up this deep dive, I think it's time to test your knowledge with some exam style questions. Let's do it. I'm ready for the challenge. Okay, get ready. First question. Which of these species is most often linked to swarming motility on agar plates? Is it A. Providencia stuarti, B. Morganella morgani, C. Proteus mirabilis, or D. Escherichia coli? Hmm, that's a classic. I'm going to go with C. Proteus mirabilis. Those bullseye patterns are a sure sign. You got it. That swarming motility is one of their defining characteristics. Okay, question number two. Which enzyme produced by many proteae is a big player in the formation of urinary stones? A. Catalase, B. Coagulase, C. Urease, or D. Beta-lactamagase? That's an easy one. It's C, urease. The breakdown of urea by urease raises the urine pH. That creates the perfect conditions for those crystals to form. Two for two. You're on a roll. Okay, here's question three. Which of these antibiotics is Proteus mirabilis usually susceptible to? A, vancomycin, B, ciprofloxacin, C, ampicillin, or D, gentamicin? Let's see. Proteus mirabilis is generally susceptible to penicillins, so I'm going to say C, ampicillin. Correct again. Three for three. Question number four. Which Providencia species is known for sticking to catheters and causing those persistent urinary tract infections? Is it A, Providencia redgeri, B, Providencia califaciens, C, Providencia stuti, or D, Providencia rustigiani? That would have to be C. Providencia stuarti. Those adhesive molecules they have make them really tough to deal with. You're unstoppable. Last question to win the quiz. Which of these is not a typical way the protea are transmitted? A. Fecal oral. B. Airborne. C. Contaminated catheters. Or D. 
contact with infected wounds. I'm going to rule out B, airborne. While these bacteria are found in the environment, they don't usually spread through the air. You did it. Five for five. Clearly, you've been listening closely. Now, let's take a closer look at those answers and talk about what they mean clinically. All right, let's go back and break down those quiz questions a bit more. That first one about swarming motility. Yeah. It's like a classic microbiology question, isn't it? It is. It is. And, you know, those concentric rings spreading out from a proteus colony. Yeah. It's something every microbiologist remembers seeing. It's pretty amazing. It is. It really shows how quickly these bacteria can colonize surfaces. It does. It does. Makes you appreciate their... Uh, efficiency, I guess, mm. even if it's a little, well, unnerving clinically. Now, that second question about urease and its role in urinary stone formation. We often think of that with Proteus, but isn't it important for other bacteria too? That's a great point. You're right. While Proteus species are well known for their urease activity, other urinary tract pathogens like Klebsiella can also produce it okay. and contribute to those stones forming. So it's not just a Proteus thing, but definitely something to keep in mind when we're dealing with UTIs in general. For sure. And that brings us to question three about Proteus mirabolus being susceptible to ampicillin. Right. Why is that? Why is this species often more susceptible to penicillins? Well, unlike some of its relatives, Proteus mirabilis doesn't have the genes for certain enzymes like beta-lactamases. Uh -huh. Those enzymes break down penicillin antibiotics. Uh, I see. So it's inherently more susceptible. So in this case, less is more. Exactly. At least when it comes to being susceptible to antibiotics. Yeah. Interesting. Now, question four was about Providencia stewardii and its uh, tendency to cause those stubborn catheter-associated UTIs. Yeah, those can be tough. What makes this species so challenging to deal with? Well, they're really good at sticking to catheters, for one thing. Right. But they've also developed all sorts of ways to resist antibiotics. They often carry plasmids. Yeah. Those are like little circular pieces of DNA. Cool. And they contain genes that make them resistant to a bunch of different antibiotics. So they're like little resistance factories. No wonder they're so hard to get rid of. And finally, that last question about how these bacteria are transmitted, it really highlighted how important those basic infection control measures are. Absolutely. Hand hygiene, proper catheter care. Yes. Those are so crucial in healthcare settings. It's a good reminder that even with all the advances in diagnostics and treatment, those basic infection control practices, they're still our best defense. I couldn't agree more. Well, I think we've successfully navigated the world of Proteus, Providencia, and Morganella. We've covered a lot today from their characteristics to their clinical significance. We have. It's been a great discussion. It has. It has. And I hope our listeners have a new appreciation for these often overlooked bacteria. I hope so, too. They may not be glamorous, but they're certainly important. They are. They are. And with this knowledge, our listeners should be ready to tackle any challenges these organisms throw at them. For sure. Identifying them diagnosing the infections, and figuring out the best treatment strategies. Exactly. Yeah. And as medical microbiologists, we have such an important role to play in guiding patient care. Staying current on the research and best practices, it's essential. Absolutely. Well, keep those curious minds engaged. And until next time, happy microbe hunting.